Okay, so my name is Tyler Davis, and I'm a senior here at Biola, graduating this December. Um, and today I want to talk about Christianity and the arts. This is a subject that has been kind of at the heart of most of what I've done here on campus with campus media, like the Point and the Chimes. Um, so, it's a quick overview. I want to start out by t kind of talking about my, my personal journey with music and journalism, and then talking about, like, the bigger question, why does art matter? And then how do Christians and art coexist? And then I'll end with uh, kind of my view of entertainment journalism done right. So my journey. So this is a picture of me, like 10 years old, something like that, playing piano recital. So music has been a part of my life from a very young age. Even before this, it was something that my parents noticed that I had a love for. Uh, but I did piano for several years, then went on to guitar, and uh, something that's still one of the most important things in my life. Um, and so when I started uh, at Biola, I came in with the idea that I would be a music major. Uh, I came in undeclared, um, but since I play much more by ear than I do reading music, when I kind of dabbled in the music program here, uh, I quickly learned that it was, I was going to be way in over my head. And so I just kind of stayed undeclared and was in the, the class that undeclared majors take. And that's when some members of the Chimes came in. and. Uh, spoke in class about uh, the opportunities that the Chimes had for writers and photographers and anything you could really want to do. They, they emphasized that if you don't need all this experience, we'll help you out, we'll help you edit, and you can get published. And so I thought that sounded pretty, pretty great. And I thought maybe I could combine these two loves of music and writing, because I also really enjoyed writing throughout high school. And so I thought, yeah, maybe I can combine them and, and write about music, and they loved that idea. They didn't really have a music writer at the time, and so I kind of filled that space. And for several years, I'm just freelance writing mostly music reviews and movie reviews and that sort of thing. A couple features pieces too, interviewing some folks. Um, and so that led to me um, eventually becoming the arts entertainment editor at the Times. And when I did that, I wanted to kind of go beyond just the basic reviews because Frankly, if you're not super into music or movies, reviews are, are boring. Um, that's, that's how most people see it. Um, and so I wanted to tackle some bigger questions. So along with my staff writer and good friend David Vendrell, we started um, devising these bigger pieces we'd write. So this is the first one we published called Content versus Context. And so this is something David had brought to me uh, speaking about, um, you know, not just looking at a film and it's rating of what content it has in it, but, but trying to see the bigger picture and what's the context of this content, because that's what really matters, because we can see plenty of, of violence and, and sexual content, even in, in scripture, but it's, it's what's being glorified and what's being viewed as, as evil. What is, what is the world view here? So that was a big, big question we wanted to talk about and start a conversation on campus. And then uh, we also saw we wanted to keep up with what, what was at the forefront, what was the, the secular world talking about, and of course Fifty Shades of Grey was something that was talked about a lot from the books to the, uh, eventually the film, which is what we wrote about. Um, David here was able to gain access because he was a film major and had the connections to a free screening of the, of the movie, and um, came back, I remember him calling me and saying like, man, like the, the way people are talking about this movie is so so off, it's so wrong, and and not in that it's a good movie, and, and, but in that people are glor kind of glorifying it in the world and um, seeing it as kind of this kind of cool, bad thing to, to watch when really he saw it as this super tragic story. And so um, I thought he did a great article. And um, there were people on campus that were not so keen on this conversation, uh, the, the way we approached it, I should say, and that we weren't outright saying, you should not go see this movie as a Christian. Um, and on, on the eve of the publication, um, some, some members of the media board here uh, requested that we not publish this piece, unless it was drastically changed to something that neither of us really felt comfortable with. Um, we didn't feel that we were some kind of moral arbiters on campus of what you should and shouldn't watch. We just wanted to be a part of this conversation from this Christian perspective, and so I made the call um, to go ahead and publish it. Um, so when you're starting these kind of conversations, uh, there's going to be controversy because, they, they're, because they're so important. So I think it's still, though, if it's something you truly feel is right, um, to go ahead and, and do it and push through and, and have those difficult conversations. 
and also stand up as, as an editor. I, I learned that you stand up for your writers. If you believe in what they're doing, you're going to stand next to them. So I want to move on to why does art matter? Um, so I have this quote from N.T. Wright here, a New Testament scholar, and he says, what you do in the present by painting, preaching, singing, sewing, praying, teaching, building hospitals, digging wells, campaigning for justice, writing poems, caring for the needy, loving your neighbor as yourself will last into God's future. These activities are not simply a way of making the present life a little less beastly, a little more bearable, until the day when we leave it behind altogether, as the hymn so mistakenly puts it. They are part of what we may call building for God's kingdom. So while I would never claim that it is our job entirely to build the kingdom of God, I do think that the things like making art and, and reflecting these good virtues that God has given us is a small piece of, of establishing his kingdom here. So Christian art, we are, we're all familiar with this Sistine Chapel uh, painting here by Michelangelo. So Christian art in the Renaissance, uh, it, was, it was the pinnacle. These were the greatest, most talented artists that ever lived and still are unmatched today. And um, Here's another Michelangelo sculpture. His first love was sculpture, uh, the sculpture of Moses here. So there's just Really, it's, it's difficult to find anyone that can match the, the pure talent and passion of these, these artists. And now, when you bring up Christian art, we think of this guy, uh, Thomas Kincaid, who everyone who knows me knows he's my favorite person to make fun of. But um, I, I can admit there, there's a sort of surface beauty here. Um, they call him the painter of light. He, he paints light very well. There's obviously talent. Um, but I think that the true beauty in art is something a little bit deeper. And, uh, in philosophy classes, I, I talked about, I learned about um, the idea of broken beauty. So we have like Christ's crucifixion and resurrection is an example of this idea of on surface, it's this very ugly and terrible thing. But the, this idea that something that was broken and then put back together is truly the most beautiful things there are. So then we also have Bach, who was commissioned by the church uh, to create essentially worship music. And of course, everyone knows he's just one of the greatest composers of all time. Again, unmatched today. And then, and then around the 90s, we got this guy, who, um, well, I would never want to doubt his, his personal heart or, or what he was, he was feeling behind his music. I, I think it, the music itself could have a, a bit of laziness to it. It was just reflecting the con adult contemporary music in the secular world not really pushing anything creatively. So how should Christians in art coexist? I think a big reason for this kind of change in rejecting um, art and creativity if it's not specifically Christian is due to a sort of a misunderstanding of this verse that we're all familiar with. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence, if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. So on face value, it seems like, okay, so that's what we're supposed to do. We're just supposed to look at these, these beautiful, pure, lovely things, and that's all we're going to focus on. So as Christians, that's the art we're going to make. It's going to be pretty, um, uh, which some might also call saccharine. And, and so th that's, that's kind of where I think in the 20th century people went after this verse. So there's this guy, Steve Turner, who was a music journalist and now is an author. Back in the 70s, uh, covered a lot of the, the biggest uh, rock acts of, of the 70s, and he, he hit this uh, on this Philippians verse as well. And he said that I believe Paul is saying something else. First, he is listing the standards for which we should judge all that we see, think, and do. As we read Macbeth, for example, we hold nobility and purity as our ideals, and we measure the characters against them. What we find is that although the play involves murder, deceit, pride, and betrayal, the main sinners fall victim to their sins, and the Christian values of nobility, purity, truth, and faithfulness triumph. So he also said that truth is not exclusive to believers. We accept this in areas such as medicine, cartography, and space exploration, but begrudgingly in philosophy, psychology, and the arts. So I think not only should Christians be kind of pushing these limits in these different fields, but also see that perhaps watching even secular films or listening to secular music, you can glean spiritual truth from it. So here he is back in the, in the 70s interviewing John Lennon and Yoko Ono. Um, so he really was at the forefront of, of the music journalism business at the time. Um, so he, he talked about staying at this kind of Christian community in, uh, I believe it's Sweden, called Labri. And, and they were very much into meeting the pop culture where it was at to try to understand their generation. And so he, he wrote this about uh, this song. Uh, 
Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young's uh, Woodstock. Um, and the chorus says, we are stardust, we are golden, we are billion-year-old carbon, and we've got to get ourselves back to the garden. So he wrote this. The last two lines struck me. Here was a rock supergroup alluding to the Garden of Eden. The rest of the song made clear that this was not a call for Christian conversion, but it was at least an admission that humans were in need of spiritual renewal. And he asked, where were the Christians who were anything like their equals in the business who could have engaged with this profound metaphor? And, and he also complained that most Christians, he says, were making Christian music, and that even if they were great at it, it was being unheard by these key debaters in these huge conversations of the day. So I, th I think that, that that's a great example that, that he spoke about, uh, just urging Christians to be a part of these conversations. He, um, he saw that, especially in the 70s, that these people were dealing with these huge questions that we as humans all deal with, and, and pop culture especially, these musicians were hitting on him, but he didn't see Christian filling in this space. Because he also wrote this, he said, this is an age when rock music was a lightning rod of cultural change. The words of people like Bob Dylan, Jim Morrison, Paul Simon, Jerry Garcia, Pete Townsend, John Lennon, and Paul McCartney were scrutinized for wisdom. Musicians were no longer simply entertainers, but prophets and shamans. So I'm going to uh, conclude today just talking about my view of entertainment journalism done right. First of all, I think we need to present information in its proper context. We need to see what the world is talking about. What are these films, these pieces of art, these, these pieces of music, uh, what are they saying? Um, should we just see that perhaps the, the content we see as, as negative and say, this is bad? Or should we see it as a way to, to have a conversation that needs to be had from per, perhaps a show like Breaking Bad, which is filled with violence and profanity, but deals with some of the biggest questions we have about evil? I think we need to be a part of a conversation and not simply conde condemn this secular entertainment. Um, like like uh, Steve Turner was talking about, uh, Christians filling that void of, of being a part of these conversations with these big questions because, after all, we claim to have some idea of what the truth is. So I believe, especially as journalists, but truth is our greatest virtue. Hitting on that, on these big questions, is, is a huge importance. And also, I think we need to start valuable conversations. We shouldn't settle to just be a part of them, but be starting them. Again, we claim to have this understanding of, of truth, of objective truth. So just as in art, uh, we had people like Michelangelo who, who were using these beautiful paintings and sculptures to say something and to point to something, I think as journalists, we can do the same thing by talking about the same movies and the same music that everyone else is talking about because a great deal of them do deal with these moral questions. So at this time, I can open it up uh, for questions if anyone has any.